bring you a two-part show. First up tonight, what happens when one of the most prominent voices in the community of color is silenced, specifically the African-American community? Well, tonight we'll find out. Joining us, Charles Clemens. He's a co-founder of Touch 106.1 FM, the radio station that many people in the city listen to. It's been quieted since nearly two weeks ago. Federal agents swooped down and took his transmitters. We'll find out the real story behind that and the effort to reopen this community resource. Then on the second half, the ladies from Lipstick. These are some special ladies indeed who lost children to gun violence and their campaign to rid the streets of illegal guns is starting to take hold uh, and with lots of help from city officials as well. Joining us are Ruth Rollins, Kim Odom, talk about their latest efforts to get guns off the streets of Boston. All that and more tonight on Talk of the Neighborhood. I'm Joe Heisler, your host. Tonight, a two-part show, and in this first half, uh, we'll talk about uh, the voice of the community of color and a very powerful one at that. Of course, a touch uh, 106.1 FM uh, is a, uh, a bit of an institution in the city, went quiet a little more, a little less than two weeks ago when uh, federal officials swooped down and shut down the station that had been operating for many years and silenced a voice that many people look forward to hearing. And tonight, joining us, one of the co-founders, he's also, uh, of course, uh, a DJ on the uh, station, uh, known as uh, affectionately as Brother Charles, and uh, many people recognize him now uh, uh, of late as a former mayoral candidate as well. So, nice to have him back. Uh, Charles Clemens, nice to have you here. Thanks so much pleasure, for coming Joe. and joining us. Thank you very much. Well, just for our, our viewers mm. that may not have been paying attention to the news, and it was a the big story in the papers, of course, uh, uh, tell us what happened. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, uh, Touch 106.1, uh, uh, how long have you been on the air? What, what was the impetus? How did you start it? And what happened on April 17th? Well, Touch 106.1 FM um, has been on the air almost eight years. We came on the air 2006 in November. Um, we came on the air because of the vacuum that was created in our community. Um, when it comes to the black community, there hasn't been a 24-hour voice um, that's positive on the FM dial, understanding that the FM dial is, is crystal clear mm -hmm. um, at times. Um, everybody should have equal access to the airwaves. Um, I actually helped and um, worked at some, well, volunteered at some other um, unlicensed radio stations that our Jamaican and Haitian brothers and sisters have had for many of years. And I'm a longtime resident of the city of Boston. I interned at Former WYD. Boston police officer as well, yes, I should mention. Absolutely. And I used to, and I interned at WYLD back in 79 and 81. Uh, where I became um, one of the youngest music directors in the country in Billboard magazine. However, I couldn't understand how it was possible that all these radio stations were popping up in our city and we didn't have a voice, a positive voice, of a voice that was profanity free and understanding that the airwaves are owned by the people. Um, this was, of course, after WILD uh, closed as well, or was that before that? Well, um, it was during that time also. Mm -hmm. um, there are over 20 unlicensed radio stations in the city, city of Boston and over 10 in Brockton and, and, and all over the place. And the reason why is if you look at those unlicensed radio stations, 99% of them are, are owned and operated by people of color. Um, the airwaves belongs to the people. Um, everyone should have a right uh, to the airwaves, and it's not fair that voices are being silenced. So with my background in, in communications and being a DJ um, and also being a former Boston police officer, listening to the concerns and issues of the community and living the tragedies that are in our community, mm -hmm. uh, how, could, how could I, with a clear conscience, stand by and allow this to happen? Mm -hmm. And so um, I stepped out 
um, and created this low power FM station because I was under the impression that 100 watts or less, you didn't need a license. And once I found out that you needed a license, well, it, it, the, it was too late. Mm -hmm. You know, our community needed a voice and I could see how those issues and concerns were coming in over the airwaves and how the community was changing. Now, they were, uh, uh, just so people understand, uh, uh, the FCC, and that's who it was, the Federal Communications Commission, is the, are the ones that moved to shut you down. Is that correct? That's absolutely correct. Right. However, we have to understand, for over 15 years, um, we were not able to apply for a license. The window was closed. Um, it wasn't until I went before members of Congress in 2008 and in 2009 when I walked from Boston to Washington, D.C., 712 miles to address members of Congress about the Low Power FM Radio Act. Mm -hmm. And then in 2010, the House of Representatives unanimously voted for the Low Power FM Radio Act. 2011, the Senate voted. And then, of course, President Barack Obama signed uh, the... Um, the bill for the Low Power FM Radio Act. Why then did they shut you down? They shut us down because of bureaucracy. Um, the, we were unlicensed, and we've never denied that we were a licensed radio station. However, um, when you have um, a people, the black community that needs a voice, um, when you have civics that was removed from the Boston, Boston Public Schools for over 25 years ago and black history, when you have issues and concerns that need to be addressed real time and live, Boston is in the, um, is in the top 10 when it comes to the media mm -hmm. market. How is it possible that the black community has no representation on the airway? Now, what, what happened that day? Uh, I understand that you... Uh uh, the station was operated from uh, the location of a nonprofit that your mother was involved well, in. Well, let's, let's, and, let's. And, and did they, I mean, yeah, we're, let's, let's we're, we also, have visions of, uh, you know, federal uh, agents coming in. And we're, did let's, you have any warning at all? Well, let, let's, let's stick to where, first of all, licenses were not available for over 15 years. They right. were not available. Right. And after President Barack Obama um, signed that bill, the license became available last October with a very small window. But let's go back to 2008, 2009, when I was advocating for the Low Power FM Radio Act bill. The FCC decided to give me a fine. Joe, once you are given a fine, you cannot apply for a license. So, so that, not uh, only was the licenses not available, then they hit me with a fine, so I, we couldn't, I could not apply for a license, and I had to make sure that the community had a voice. But did you have uh, an inkling this was coming? I mean, they, did they give you some warning? I And uh, don't get me wrong, I don't believe everything I read, but the, uh, the papers indicated that y you had some sense that they were well, they were they were gunning for you, so to speak. Uh, I, I, maybe that's the wrong word to no, use. No, what, uh, what I understood is that uh, Touch 106.1 FM uh, was growing uh, meaning, when I, when I mean it was growing, the community was being engaged. And you have elected officials and nonprofit organizations and resources going out to the community. You, uh, I understand when you're doing something that right, uh, the opposite, well, the opposite um, uh, uh, forces will come at you. So did I think that one day the FCC would come knocking on the door? Absolutely. But that wasn't going to stray touch 106.1 FM by giving a voice to the community. Well, well, you, you were in operation for all those years, and I, I want to ask you about now the efforts to, to, to reopen as well. And I think that's probably uh, in many ways as important or maybe more important. But uh, um, again, the article seemed to indicate that that part of what brought some unwanted attention, because you, you had been operating for many years, was the, the fact that you ran for mayor and uh, uh, that you, uh, of course, uh, weren't, uh, you talked about the fact that you uh, were in the race, uh, how you did it. Uh, I'm not sure I didn't hear it, but uh, uh, do you have any doubts now about that, 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 that maybe that that somehow uh, 
brought this all into play that uh, unfortunately it's an unfortunate you happenstance know, no doubt but uh, Joe I don't think and you were a credible candidate I will say it. Thank you, you did sir. very well excuse me yeah. but uh, well, let, let me say this Joe uh, it did not it wasn't about me running for mayor because the reason why I ran for mayor is because the community needed a voice just like the community needed a voice on the airwaves, I took it to the next level. I listened to the issues and concerns of the community. However, uh, what, what you have to um, look at is that even when I ran for mayor, I left the airwaves and, um, and it wasn't until uh, I was certified at, with my certified signatures mm -hmm. On July 1st, I left the airwaves, and Jimmy Myers actually took my spot on the morning show. So there's no uh, question about equal time as far as no, you, they, you're... We've always had an open-door policy, um, Joe, and the reason why we had an open-door policy is because you're either part of the solution or part of the problem. Mm -hmm. Our community needed access to resources. The elected officials, we elected the elected, we, uh, we elect the elected officials to get into office to bring the resources back to us, but also um, there are, there are um, uh, issues and, and there are resources that are going on in our community that people don't know about. Touch 106.1 FM was that platform. You know, the experts when it comes to the issues and the information in the streets are the people, and you have to listen to the people. Well, uh, and believe me, we can appreciate it here, uh, all the work that uh, BNN does, and I, I don't mean to uh, toot our own horn here, but uh, giving a voice to a lot of people and a lot of information that wouldn't see the light of day if it weren't for uh, BNN, so I can really appreciate what, what you were doing there. Well, that said, uh, you're shut down now. They took your transmitters away. Well, they even. took the transmitter. They took everything, Joe. They took computers. They took um, the mixing board. They took wires and microphones. Mm -hmm. They took the, the antenna. They cut things. Uh, we had our own surveillance cameras. Um, they even um, uh, covered up the cameras and, and, and unplugged wires, I guess, so that we couldn't see what was being done. They were in there from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. in the afternoon, just cutting things off, you know, ripping the community apart. But Touch 106.1 FM is going to get a license. Touch 106.1 FM, we have our legal team uh, that's gathering information along with um, the elected officials, mm -hmm. we're working, we're collaborating from the local level to the state level to the federal level, because this fight's going to happen at the federal level. Well, I was going to say, you, you, you've got a lot of support uh, all the way, uh, in, including uh, Governor Patrick uh, voicing his support, but uh, uh, certainly uh, many people in the community uh, were very outspoken about uh, what had happened. Uh, so what's the next steps? Well, uh, because, uh, of course, uh, you know, this is the federal government. You mentioned it before, the bureaucracy in action, and sometimes it's uh, that red, red tape that gets wrapped around right. stuff. It's tough to get off. A absolutely. However, you have to uh, make sure that you're consistent and you stay fast. Joe, when you believe in something and you want something bad enough, you have to fight for it. And we're going to fight for the voice of the community. And that's why if you go to change.org, you can sign the petition. Um, at change.org and just type in touch FM. Also, um, when it comes to, when it comes to um, streaming, um, they, they, they dismantle our streaming capabilities. But at 11 a.m., 11 p.m. that night, we were up and streaming again. So you can still listen to us and, and download our app at touchfm.org. And you, and you can go anywhere with us. Um, that's not going to deter mm -hmm. us. We're going to stay steadfast. We're going to make sure um, that we work and do it the right way. Now, what is the right way? I'll figure that out. <laughs> but we're going to make sure we do it the right way. What about all of all your colleagues there? Uh, you know, I, I, your your lineup there is incredible. You have all these different uh, uh, DJs, for lack radio of a better term, and yes, radio sir. personalities. Yeah. Uh, uh, the, very disappointing to them, I'm sure. And uh, uh, were you uh, uh, pleased at the reaction that? Uh, uh, you know, no one likes to be to hear bad news, but uh, it's always nice to hear uh, that you've got friends that you maybe didn't know about. Well, that goes back to the equal access that Touch 106.1 FM has had all these years. Mm -hmm. 
Everyone is invited to come to Touch 106.1 FM, and we get phone calls all the time. Um, Touch 106.1 FM is not just a radio station. You know, we have found lost children. Folks have called in that we're going to commit suicide, and we help stop that. Um, when folks needed heat and oil in their homes, we took care of them. Um, we make sure the community came together and organized. So, Joe, what's going to happen is that with this fight at the federal level, you know, the communities, this is going to be a tsunami effect where the community rallies together, mm -hmm. and then from the community, we go to our elected officials. Now, I, when I want to thank City Councilor Ayanna Presley and, and City Councilor Charles Yancey that's organizing the elected mm -hmm. officials on the, um, on the uh, local level. And then when it comes to the state level, we have State Representative Gloria Fox and State Representative Russell Holmes and the Black and Latino Caucus um, organizing. Mm -hmm. And then on the federal level, we have Governor Deval Patrick, who was very disappointed um, with, with these actions and actually tried to stop it. But like, like we know, we understand this is well, happening what at the mean? federal. What do you mean? Did, did he uh, make a call to? No, uh, actually he had a heads up that it was, go it was going to happen. Yeah. And, he and he even said that touch is a very important voice in yeah. the community. When it comes to our U.S. Attorney, um, Carmen Ortiz, if she had the opportunity to be on touch, experience touch, I honestly believe she wouldn't have signed off on it because she stated that we are a disaster threat. How could we possibly be a disaster threat when we're rooted in the community uh, and it, we have educated people in the bioterror lab that's in our community? Is it a little disappointing? Uh, not just her, she's a person of color, uh, but uh, you know, this is Barack Obama's administration, the first African-American president, uh, that they would treat uh, someone like you in such a cavalier way? Well, things happen, Joe. Uh, there's five words that I say 25 times a day. Pray, create, adapt, improvise, and overcome. Mm -hmm. We're meeting all obstacles in our path. This is just um, on the wake of the marathon. The toughest route, Joe, is Heartbreak Hill. We're at Heartbreak Hill, mm -hmm. and we're going to win this. Yeah, and you're, you're, uh, you're not letting this get you down. I know you've, this has been a labor of love for you. It's not like it's some uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, enterprise that's uh, yielding uh, Joe, whatever. On, I know it's uh, you on know, the you've very hard about it, on this. And, and, um, Joe, on the, on the campaign, campaign trail, I stated, you're either part of the solution or part of the problem. And I truly believe that my brothers and sisters' problems are my problems, and we solve those problems together. We have to look at, at our elderly. The elderly or our mature adults, they count on Touch 106.1 FM to get information. And not all of them are savvy when it comes to the Internet. Then you have in our community that there are people that cannot read. And they listen to the radio to get their information. How could you, with a conscious mind, do um, silence a community? How can you do that? It's not right. And, I, and I'll go back to Rosa Parks. You know, it was illegal to sit on the front of the bus, but it wasn't right. But she did it. Well, and, and I want to ask you, and we've got just a minute or so left, yes, because, sir. of course, uh, anybody that went through the uh, civil rights era, you know, understands civil disobedience is... Is that how you look at this? And I, that's an oversimplification. I, I, Don't get me I wrong. I look but, at this uh, as a violation but, of our civil rights and our human rights. Everyone should have equal access to media. Everyone should have equal access to the airways. The airways belongs to the people. However, it's regulated by the FCC. Well, and it's uh, not right. It's, a, it's, it's unfortunate. As you said, uh, there, there are many uh, stations. Some people refer to them as... Uh, uh, pirate radio stations. I don't know anybody that uh, refers to uh, Touch uh, 106.1 <laughs> FM as such, uh, but it is quiet for now. Um, We're on and, the internet. And they are on the internet. Uh, and uh, what's the uh, website? How can they D reach you? Go to www.touchfm.org. And you can and still hear. Come on in and you can get that information. Well, and uh, an effort underway to get back on the radio airwaves as well. Uh, joining me to talk about it, 
Charles Clemens, he is one of the co-founders of this station. And Charles, I want to wish you the best of luck. Uh, Joe, thank you very it. much. We're going, to win. Fight. We're going to win this fight with oh. the people and with people like you. Well, we thank know, you. Uh, we know what it's like uh, uh, to be an underdog in the media market here. Uh, well, we'll shift gears a bit. Uh, joining us, the, the ladies from Lipstick, uh, a couple of uh, key organizers from Citizens for Safety. Uh, they... Uh, have both lost uh, loved ones to uh, gun violence on the streets of the city of Boston, and uh, they haven't given up. They're doing something to get those guns off the street. Kim Odom and Ruth Rollins join us from uh, Lipstick. With more of Talk to the Neighborhoods, I'm Joe Heisler, your host. And in the second half, Lipstick. It's not a cosmetic, it's the real thing. And I've got a couple of guests in this segment uh, uh, who are willing to share their stories about uh, what's happening on the streets of the city of Boston, uh, the illegal guns that are coming into our community. And uh, despite the tragedy in their families' lives, they're doing something about it. And I'm very pleased to have Coming back and joining us, uh, Ruth Rollins and Kim Odom. Nice to have you both here from uh, Citizens for Safety. Uh, the lipstick, lipstick <laughs> campaign, now let me uh, get that out. Uh, ladies involved in putting a stop to inner city killing. And uh, I know you've been busy and you got a big event coming up as well. And we'll talk a little bit about that as well. But uh, help our, uh, our viewers that might not be familiar with uh, what you're doing here and what was the impetus for lipstick and what kinds of things are you doing and what are you what are you talking about what are you telling people that are willing to listen mm. okay so you're right joe you have it you have it correct this time lipstick ladies involved in putting a stop to inner city killing so um research has shown that um the same way women are disproportionately used in sex trafficking and trafficking drugs um, we were able to, um, the first in the country, which we're really proud about, how women, the same way women are being used to traffic in firearms and holding and hiding them. So what we've been able to do is these educational workshops, and we've been able to change behaviors also. Uh, and just uh, how widespread is this? Because I, I think a lot of people don't quite understand uh, uh, hiding Handguns, uh, how common is that? How, how prevalent is that? Well, it, it, you know, it's, it's, it's showing that it is prevalent both here in, in, in Boston in terms of holding and hiding, but also in the straw buying piece too. Um, women being exploited to, to go and purchase guns. And in mo most cases, the straw buying um, happens uh, sometimes uh, with young ladies who live in states where uh, the laws are, um, aren't, as, at a, aren't as strict as the laws here mm -hmm. in Massachusetts, and they're um, influenced to um, buy those guns and, and help the, you know, that, that boyfriend or whoever that person is that they met um, that has, that's a felon that's not able to purchase guns legally, um, it, you know, they're, they're, they're helping them to get those, get those guns and pass them on, and, and that, that's how they're ending up. In, in the inner, inner city. Are, are we able to, uh, there was a, a big story in today's Boston Globe, actually the front page uh, story, the top of the fold, uh, about uh, uh, the interchange of drugs and guns between uh, Massachusetts and Vermont in this instance, which has you know, virtually no regulation at all as far as firearms. I, of course, we always talk about New Hampshire because it's the uh, uh, same thing right next door, but uh, uh, where are these guns coming from, and what are, what are we finding out about them? Well, that certainly is the, the model question for um, Citizens for Safety, is to, to make sure that we are asking that question, where did the guns come from? And, um, you know, as, as we said, in, in, in the research has shown in, in, in some cases it's women being exploited to straw buy, to hold and hide, mm -hmm. and there are also cases where um, folks are able to go to gun shows um, and uh, that and they don't have to pass a background check and um, you know uh, it, 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 the, the guns are 
Um, you know, sometimes it's, it's private, private sale because mm -hmm. people aren't um, required to have to, to also, you know, to, to also um, have to go through a, a, a background check right. for private sale. So it's these different um, sources uh, that, that help, you know, create that uh, opportunity or that loophole for people mm -hmm. who, who are um, felons or um, uh, mentally, d deemed mentally ill or, um, mm -hmm. or juveniles to get those guns in their hands. Well, of course, uh, there has been, and you both experienced this uh, firsthand, and uh, I, you know, I, I don't know how you do what you do, so I, you know, uh, I have nothing but admiration for it, but, but you know, a lot of people uh, have a hard time kind of coming to grips with this. I, I, they, they just don't realize the, the level of, of what's going on, you know, on the street. It's hard for them to kind of grasp. And uh, are you helping? And uh, you, are you getting through to, uh, and I know, you know, there's probably no one better to be talking to the people than, than you two uh, based on your own personal experiences, but are, are you getting through to people? Do they starting to understand just how serious and, you know, you know kind of uh, right below the surface level this is going on, uh, people hiding guns, people sharing guns, uh, illegal guns being brought in and, you know, traded for whether it's guns or, or for drugs or what have you. Uh, people, I think, really understand the seriousness, of, I guess, if uh, they've experienced it firsthand. But what about those that haven't experienced this violence firsthand? Well, Ruth? There's a lot of judgment that comes out of it, um, but one of the great things that we offer in our workshop is without judgment. So we have some women firsthand that were involved in purchasing firearms. We get a lot of grandmothers that come forward about guns being in their home. And what we're able to do is educate, but also empower for them not to condone that behavior. So depending on who you ask, you know, we had several articles and one was, um, it was a lot of um, bashing, I would say, especially from the NRA. You know, fabrication, not true. Right. What world do we live in? <laughs> but it's really, it's true, you know. They can't um, be living in the same city we are, but. Exactly. You know. But I think the value that me and Kim bring, you know, um, how we would put together and I believe that, you know, we've been able to you know, change behavior, behavior and touch a lot of people, especially in our workshops where people are able to come forward and mm -hmm. talk about their involvement or ways that they want to get involved or ways that they want to make a difference in their community and the ways that they're working with young women and older women. So this isn't just a younger woman campaign. Mm -hmm. We're talking to the aunts, the grandmothers, and, you know, um, because most of us know what's going on in our household. So um, Tough for them to kind of look the other way, when, especially when it involves family members? Well, there's a lot of layers to this, and we're finding out more and more there's a lot of layers, you know. Um, and, and I say this over and over again, that we bring no judgment. So I think it makes people, a lot of people mm -hmm. come forward because, for you know, it's various reasons, you know, um, why people do um, that type of behavior. A lot of people don't understand it, but um, from the work that I do on a daily basis, I know that there's lots of layers to this behavior, mm -hmm. you know, um, and why women are involved and young men. What do you tell them? Uh, you know, you know, you have to tell your son, your husband, your boyfriend, your and don't get me wrong, it's not all one uh, sex, one dimensional right. type thing. Uh, but uh, uh, look, uh, you know, it's either uh, the gun or you is going to leave. Well, what what do you actually? Well, in, in the educational um, you know message that we have in our training is to talk about and, and I often say to raise the moral consciousness, mm -hmm. but also uh, speak to the legal consequences. So we talk about that you know certainly the moral consciousness pieces that you know the, that that holding that gun, that mm -hmm. buy, hiding that gun, that buying that gun you might not think that you're contributing to the harm or ultimate death of another person, but really you are. And in many cases, it's, it, it's impacting either you, your family, or mm -hmm. your community, because we're, we're all connected in our community. Right. And so we need to raise that moral consciousness that we're, we're, um, harming, we're hurting our own community when we do that. And then the other, other piece to that is the legal consequences, mm -hmm. recognizing that when you do that, that you're gonna you're gonna spend 
spend the time. And just like we right. had that the um, the launching of the MBTA ad, yep. and in that ad, the you know and there's a female whose hands behind her back handcuffed, and the tagline is uh, "His crime, your That's time," right. and really trying to get. Um, you know, our, 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 our women to understand th those who are, are, are um, you know, uh, are influenced in, in that manner to really think about what that what that really mm -hmm. means to to them, to their family, to their future. And, and you know, uh, Ruthie Alt has the saying that she she uses that your past doesn't have to be your future. And so we always try to speak to the strength base of this, the same, like right. you said. And, and we're forward, talking yeah. we're talking about em yeah. empowering, and this is about prevent preventative as yeah. well. You know, talking about prevention because we want to make sure that we're reaching, um, you know. Uh, young girl, young girls who be, can be influenced in this way, um, and and you know adult women across the board. We're, it, it's, we're not talking about specific color. It's it's women of all um, ages, especially um, you know teenage and and, and and up. But it's a preventative yeah. program. Tell, tell uh, about the uh, MBTA ad because I, I you know it was really uh, very uh, innovative and very. Uh uh, compelling, I thought. Uh, how did that get started, and what's been the reaction to it so far? So we were able to, myself and Kim and a few other lipstick ladies, um, were able to have a meeting with the chief of MBTA, um, is it Chief McMahon, mm -hmm. that agreed to fund some trolley cars for us um, with the lipstick ad, and it took several months to put together. Nancy Robertson had got um, an ad campaign to agree to come up with the logo, with the um, with the drafting, well, ideas from the lipstick ladies, and we, as a team, we created it. Mm -hmm. And what um, we did a launch. What date was it? Um, back in February, February twenty yeah. second, I think it was. We did a launch with all our partners that have worked with us up until this mm -hmm. point. Um, the district attorney, um, my life, my choice. They were, they were on the logo. Elizabeth Stonehouse was on the logo. Um, Project Right has been a partner with us. Mm -hmm. We had the great opportunity of having the mayor there. Um, Iana Presley and several other um, um, organizers and that's when we did the launch. We wanted to come up with a campaign that would bring awareness to the whole straw purchasing. And with that, you know, um, we got, it, it was a 90 day ad, but through the great response we have gotten, we got an additional, I believe, additional couple of more months. Mm. So um, we're trying to you know, we're not trying. I'm going to take Kim's word. We were putting it on blast. <laughs> it was only supposed to be on a, um, a few different um, trains. Car trains, but, Some you know, discussion. everyone sees it. Yes. You know, in well, I, I saw it. I said, hey, I know <laughs> those <laughs> people, y'all. Yeah. Yeah. It was nice yeah. to see. Yeah, and one yeah. of the goals of that, which um, Ruthie speaks to, is that the, the organizations that partnered with us, especially Elizabeth Stonehouse and uh, My Life, My Choice, and we, we, we realize that when you're asking people to change behavior, that you have to re, you know help them replace that behavior with the positive. You turn that negative into a positive. And so we realize that we need to be able to provide resources to help people to do that. Well, I don't know how you continue to be so positive. I, it's nice to see you back. I remember when you first started uh, Lipstick. And of course, I've been talking with uh, uh, Nancy from uh, Citizens for Safety for, you know, few years now, uh, I, you know, uh, when you experience the kind of personal tragedy in your lives that you both have experienced, uh, how, how, do you, how do you maintain your faith? How do you keep hope? I, I mean, you know, maybe it's a spiritual or religious thing, but uh, uh, I, I, you know, and believe me when I say it, I have nothing for ad but admiration for what you're doing here because, uh, you know, you just kind of keep marching forward, and thank God you are, but uh, how do you do it? Well, I think we pull off each other's strength. Like tonight, Kim's not at her fullest. You know, she had a rough couple of days, but you would never know it. I guess we both wear it well, but we pull off each other. Um, I got a great support with my family, but um, we do. I know I do. I check mm -hmm. out sometimes, you know, which Kim will probably talk more. You know, um, we... Um, we attended a gun summit, so at any given time, you know, um, things come up, but I think doing the work, well, I know doing the work that I do and changing behaviors and, and touching other women and even other men making a difference in the community keeps me going, you know. Um, and, and my granddaughter, my son that passed away, um, left my only grandchild 
um, behind and at any given day, my worst day, I just lay in the bed and hold her. You know, she looks like him, acts like him, <laughs> you know. But I'm um, really just continuing doing the work and making a difference in other people's lives, you know. Um, I believe that's my calling. Mm -hmm. You know, that's my calling. Um, and, and I chose this campaign because I believed in it. You know, um, th there's different programs and there's a lot of different ones for men. You know, this one's for women, but we don't discriminate. We have a lot of um, lipstick men. <laughs> <laughs> But because of my day job, they don't I look as good. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, no, it depends. We got yeah, Ronnie. Right. We got my <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. you know, um, through my day job, I just see the many layers and how a lot of yeah. these young women and older women are being coerced. You know, not all, but there are. There's a large yeah. majority of them. Yeah. And 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 when you talked about the the drugs and guns and drugs and guns and you know, and depending on who you ask. You know, it, it's it's layers and layers and layers, you know, um, how women are being coerced. And it may not be that day, but it may be a week or a month, a year down the road, who knows? Uh, you realize that you got through to somebody and... Yeah, and, and, and that's the rewarding thing when you, when you hear that, you know, positive feedback and people say, you know, I heard you all and, mm -hmm. you know, keep up the good work. And sometimes we do get those phone calls where, um, you know, uh, mothers are calling and, 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 um, and, and you know, just to, to speak to, you know, you ask, how, you know, how do you do this? You know, for, for me, it, it is that, that faith-based piece, but, you know, I, I'll be um, transparent and real to say that, you, as Ruthie said, you have those days where sometimes you feel like, you know, do I want to keep doing this, mm -hmm. you know, and then you realize, yeah, you know, this has become the calling. And when I think about my son's word, Stephen, he, he had a, a peace journal, and in his peace journal, he wrote, um, it's a shame that people get shot and killed every day. And so Stephen mm -hmm. understood uh, that, that this was not, it was not normal in, in the community for this to be happening. And I often say that he didn't know that he was talking about a public health epidemic, um, but, but it was, uh, I took it upon myself to be his advocate to, to really understand um, the root cause of what was going on in our community, not just about the perpetrator, who did it and why, and that's an important piece to the puzzle. You mm -hmm. wanna know that people yeah. need to be held accountable for their wrong and held accountable in a, in a um, pr um, rehabilitative way. Mm -hmm. um, however, it is important also to know where that gun came from. What's the pattern of how these guns are ending up in our community and um, taking the lives of, of, of loved ones? Well, you know, it, there was a, a, talking about uh, what's recently been in print, there was also a piece in the uh, New York Times recently about these, uh, now they're, I hesitate to call them uh, this, but smart guns where uh, you can, uh, based on uh, the, uh, the make and model of uh, these guns, you can uh, trace a lot of things or, you know, even to the point of where now they're developing guns that won't fire unless the person whose fingerprints are match them. I, <laughs> I, I'd have to see it to believe it, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, do you feel like you know, th there's been so much back and forth, and of course there's the whole Second Amendment thing, but you know, for every step forward, it seems like there's a step back at times. Uh, you know, they just recently struck down a law in California where, you know, that allowed, uh, that prohibited people from mm -hmm. uh, holding concealed guns. Mm -hmm. And of course, depending upon what state you go, it's, it's, it's permissible and, uh, uh, are we, in your mind, are we are we making progress on this? I mean, you, you know, anybody that's in the city, you, know, you see somebody with a gun, you know, it, there's nothing good that's gonna happen, you know, if at all. But uh, of course, different states are different, and uh, uh, I know this campaign you know, throughout uh, the country uh, to try and do something about it, but uh, are you optimistic, I guess? Well, and I, I would say yes. It's, it's kinda like the butterfly effect. Hmm. It speaks to the um, summit we attended. Everything <laughs> and above what he just asked. Yeah, I mean, again, it's like the butterfly effect. Sometimes it, you don't, might not see it happening, but but you believe that it is happening in time that it, it will show itself. It will um, show for, for fruition. But again, we always speak to um, the public health piece of this, and in, in, in our in our um, training, we talk about how. 
um, you know, you have the, 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 the gun dealer, the straw buyer, the, the, the shooter, and the victim. And we ask that question, when, when there's a shooting in the community, where does the, um, you know, the media and the public focus? And folks will, um, you know, look, will say this in, the victim and the shooter. And uh, then we ask the question, okay, let's flip the, flip the script, so to speak. And so the cards we turn over, and so we said, well, if we were talking about um, salmonella and peanut butter, um, and, and you had the, the trucking company, the, the peanut plant, the trucking company, the supermarket, and the victim, where would then would the media and the, um, the public focus and people say, oh, um, the supermarket, <laughs> you know, and, and what we realize, the analogy that we use with that is that's kind of like the gun buyback program. Um, you know, the supermarket, the recall, you take it off, but you can't stop there. You have to go back to the source. You right. have to go back to the source. So, so we ask the question, if, so we ask people, turn the cards back around, okay, if we were, um, you know, focused on the, sh the shooter, how many guns would we get off the street? Maybe that one, right? But if we focused on the other, the other end with the gun deal and the straw buyer, mm -hmm. then the, you ask that question, how many guns would we get off? And people say uh, a, a lot more, a lot more, because you're stopping it at that, you know, at that, at that level. And so we, we want to always look at things at the public health perspective. And this is, we see um, the illegal gun trafficking, gun trafficking as not just public safety, but also public health. Right, and uh, again, uh, if you haven't heard of them, uh, lipstick is, uh, in this instance, not a cosmetic. It's ladies involved in putting a stop to inner city killing, and I'm, I'm getting it right this time. Uh, my guests, uh, Kim Odom, Ruth Rollins, they're uh, two directors of the lipstick campaign. Uh, their uh, next training session, and they speak the truth, is uh, you don't want to miss a Saturday, May 3rd, and at, uh, from 10 a.m. to noon at the Grove Hall Public Library in uh, Dorchester. And uh, if they want to reach out to you and find out more about lipstick, more about Citizens for Safety, um, now you're going to make me read this <laughs> now, aren't you, Ruth? Huh? Wait a minute. Oh, wait a minute. Um, of course, it's uh, where did the guns come from? Dot com. What else? Uh, and if and they the are number. in the phone number. Yeah. And that is six one seven two three three five eight five three five three six three. Five, three, three. In, any, <laughs> in any event, if you're unable to attend this month's training, we have a bi week, bi monthly, every first Saturday of right. the month at the Grove Hall. No, and again, go to the website, uh, www.wherethegunscomefrom.com. Again, ladies, thanks for Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, lipstick, Citizens for Safety, for the entire staff and crew here at BNN TV. Thank you for watching. Talk to the neighbors. Have a pleasant evening.